Hello to everyone. I'm Claudio Marcantonini. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Climate Policy Research Unit at the European University Institute in Florence. In our unit, uh, we work on, uh, on climate policy, specifically on uh, ex post analysis of European climate policies. And we are funded by uh, the uh, EU Commission, in particular by DG Climate. And uh, all our research uh, that we do in our uh, unit, uh, it is possible to download it from our uh, website. The uh, presentation of today will be about renewable energy, in particular about the policies to support renewable energy and uh, about their cost. So first of all, uh, uh, let me start with the outline of the presentation. In the first part, uh, I will speak about the European context <clears throat> and what is the role of the uh, renewable energy into the uh, 2020 uh, climate and energy package. Second, I will define the implicit carbon price and the relation between the implicit carbon price and the cost of renewable energy. Third, I will give uh, just a few details on the methodology uh, we have used in order to estimate the implicit carbon price. And fourth, there will be the results for the implicit carbon price for uh, three countries. The first country will be Germany. This is based on the work uh, on uh, two uh, uh, published papers. Uh, one uh, was done by Hannes Waite, Eric Delarue, and Deli Danny Ellerman. And the second one was done by myself and Danny Ellerman. You can download these uh, papers from our website. Regarding the second paper, uh, there will be a, a revision. So a new version is coming. And uh, the result of today will refer to this new version coming. I will also show you some results uh, for Italy. Uh, the research for this country was done by myself, Vanessa Valerio, in collaboration with REFI, which is a consulting company based in Milan. And I will also give you some results from Spain, who comes from the work done by uh, Julian Barkelgil at Indesa. Okay, let's start. Uh, European Union has a very ambitious climate and energy policy for 2020. And in particular, there are two binding targets. The first target is the climate target. That is increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing uh, of 20% CO2 emission reduction from 1990 levels. Just the justification for this target is the mitigation of global warming. And the main instrument to reach this target is the CO2 carbon market uh, called EU ETS. This is a classical cap and trade scheme. That is, the EU fixes the uh, cap of total emission, and the cap is reduced every year of a small percentage, and issues a number of allowances proportional to this cap. And uh, uh, power plants and big industrial uh, installations, if they want to emit CO2, uh, they have to buy allowances. There are many details regarding how the allowances are located, but uh, the key point is that Within the UTS, there is a clear and uniform price all over the Europe for each ton of CO2 that is reduced. <clears throat> we can call this instrument climate policy instrument, meaning that any instrument whose goal is to reduce CO2 emission. The second target is the renewable target. Increasing the uh, share of energy consumption from renewable energy sources to 20%. In this case, there is not a single instrument to reach this target, but there are many instruments. Uh, this is because this target was allocated to member state, and uh, practically each member state um, has the freedom uh, to develop uh, the policy that they like in order to um, increase the share of renewable energy within uh, their countries. Uh, there are many different policies. In general, uh, they are in the form of direct incentives for renewable energy. Uh, these, all these policies, they have been very effective into um, 
increasing the share of renewable energy, in particular in the electricity sector. So this graph shows the percentage of electricity generated from renewable energy sources, and we can see that in less than uh, 10 years it almost duplicated. But what is the justification for this uh, second target? Why EU wants to increase the share of renewable energy? Okay, I want to ask to you this question, and uh, uh, I want to start you our uh, first quick poll. Okay, and I will launch the poll. So, what do you think is the first justification for the, the renewable target? There may be many justifications. What, what do you think is the first one? And here there are four options. To reduce the dependence on fossil fuels, to provide opportunities for employment and regional development, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or to promote innovation. Okay, I see that already quite of you have voted. Okay. I'll give you a few other seconds. Oh, very good. You're quite quick to vote. <laughs> okay. I think, oh, last one. Okay, I think that I can close now the pool. And uh, let's see the result. Okay, so see that you are divided. Most of you said to reduce greenhouse gas emission, 47%. Second one, another big share says to reduce dependence of fossil fuel. Why to promote innovation and to provide opportunities for employment and regional development, I um, mean, just a few of you voted for it. Okay, actually, if you read the Renewable Energy Directive, just at the very beginning, there's written that practically the first certification to reduce, greenhouse, to increase the share of, of renewable energy is to reduce greenhouse gas emission. There are other justifications, but they come after it, okay? And uh, in this um, uh, presentation, in this research, we will look at renewable energy only from this point of view, only from the climate policy point of view. So for the moment, practically, we will uh, neglect other rationals to develop renewable energy, such as, as I listed before, security of supply, uh, or uh, technological innovation, uh, or increasing the number of uh, green jobs. But we only look at renewable energy as a way to reduce CO2 emissions. And uh, the policies, um, whose goal is to increase the share of renewable energy can be defined as a climate policies. That's because, as I said, their goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emission. And as we, we can ask, have renewable energy incentives been efficient climate policy instrument? What was the cost of these policies if you look at renewable energy only from a climate policy point of view? Now, answering this question is not only important from an academic point of view, but it's also important from a political point of view. In fact, the European Commission has already started working on developing a, a new policies uh, on climate energy for 2030. There was uh, recently a green paper published. There was also a public consultation. And uh, in the green paper, there's written that if you want to uh, build a framework for the new climate and energy policy for 2030, the first things to do is to look at the current uh, framework, to look at the current policy for 2020. What has worked, what has not worked, and what can be improved. Practically, analyzing the performance of the current policies, it's important in order to define future policies. Okay, I think that I convince you that uh, answering this question uh, it's, it's an interesting topic. And um, I will now um, go to our second section. It is, this is the implicit carbon price. So we want to answer the question, what is the efficiency of the, uh, Europe, of the uh, renewable energy incentives as a climate policy instrument, okay? In order to answer this question in a quantitative way, practically we need to measure something. And what we measure is the implicit carbon price. This is defined as the equivalent carbon price being paid when we think of renewable energy incentives only as a climate instrument alone. 
and it's given by this formula. It is the ratio of the net cost of renewables over the CO2 emission reduction. With net cost of renewables, we mean the sum of the costs and savings from consumer resulting from the injection of renewable energy into the electric power system. So there are two important observations to make. Uh, first, in this analysis, we will only look at the uh, impact of renewable energy into uh, generating electricity. So we will not um, analyze um, other sectors uh, where renewable energy is important. And second, we will, uh, when we say cost, uh, we always say cost from the consumer's point of view. That is, practically how much consumers have paid in order to have renewable energy into the system. The CO2 emission reduction, instead, is the net change in CO2 emissions uh, between the power system with and without uh, the renewable energy. In other words, it is the um, reduction of CO2 uh, emission that can be attributed to the presence of renewable energy into the power system. So practically the implicit carbon price, we, we can think of it as the uh, hypothetical carbon price that would make uh, renewable energy economic. Or in other words, uh, it also, um, we can also say as the cost of reducing CO2 emission using uh, renewable energy. So in particular, in this uh, research, we have analyzed uh, two technologies, wind and solar. And probably from now on, when I say renewable energy, I always mean either wind or solar. Uh, we will look at three countries, as I said, Germany, Italy, and Spain. So we will calculate the cost for renewable energy within each of these countries. And third, we will look at the years from 2006 to 2012. That is, we will look at the past. I will not show you ex-ante analysis of future costs, but actually ex-post analysis of, of the cost that has already occurred. So are the costs for uh, the capacity of wind and solar that was already installed. Uh, this is because the goal of this research is not the estimation of future development of wind and solar, but actually how the system has performed up to now, up to this moment. Okay, as I said to you before, the implicit carbon price depend, it depends on the cost of renewable energy. So it's important to, uh, uh, to let you know which cost and savings we have taken in, into account in this analysis. The first cost is the remuneration to generators. That is, how much renewable energy producers uh, were paid in order to, to produce electricity from uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, the remuneration to generators, of course, depends on the renewable energy incentives. So somehow this is, is the direct cost of the uh, renewable energy uh, policies. So in this analysis, we do not take in account the cost of production. That is, how much it costed to renewable energy producers to produce electricity from renewable energy sources, but how much they were paid in order to do that. This is because the renewable energy incentives affects actually the remuneration, and eventually um, these costs are paid uh, by consumers in some form, in general, uh, directly into the electricity bill. So we can think that this is what consumers paid in order to have renewable energy into the system. In addition to the remuneration to generators, there are other costs of renewable energy. And this is due to the fact that wind and solar energy are intermittent source of energy. This means two things. First, they are, they are highly variable. And second, they are partially unpredictable. So this graph shows the hourly wind generation in January 2011 in Italy. And we can see this high fluctuation of wind, and these fluctuations are not correlated with demand. So they are highly variable, and as I said, they are partially unpredictable. They are not totally unpredictable. Like for example, for wind, I know there are good weather forecasts, but in general, good weather forecasts it works well in the short term, but less well in the long term. Or also for solar, we quite know 
what is the path of the sun along the year, but you know, there can be like a cloudy day uh, that is unpredicted. So they are partially unpredictable and highly variable. This uh, increases the cost of renewable energy in two ways. First, there are additional balancing costs. The balancing costs are the cost of matching low in demand in the, in the short term. And as because, as I showed you be, before, because there are this, this high uh, fluctuation and because they are partially unpredictable, I mean, this, this means that the cost of balancing is higher when we have uh, uh, wind and solar into the system. Second, there are additional cycling costs. These are the uh, additional costs for conventional generation, in particular for um, fossil fuel generation. This is because, because the, like for example, wind fluctuates a lot. Uh, coal and gas, they have to change their profile production very often in order to satisfy the demand. Um, much more often than, uh, than what was originally planned when these power plants were built. And this increases the cost in several ways. So there are higher startup costs. So this means that you have to have shut, turn on and shut up um, your, your power plant much often. There can be more uh, maintenance costs. And in general, practically the power plant works in a more inefficient way. However, uh, having renewable energy into the system does not increase only the cost, but there are also savings due to renewable energy. This is because if we increase the share of electricity from renewable energy sources, it implies that we decrease uh, the production of electricity from conventional generators, in particular from fossil fuel generators like coal and gas. So this means that to produce the same amount of energy, uh, we, mm, uh, we burn less fuels. We use less fuel gas, so we have to acquire less um, uh, uh, fossil fuel, and thus we have a fossil fuel savings. Moreover, uh, if we increase uh, the capacity of uh, wind and, uh, and solar into the system, it means that we increase the total capacity of the system. And we could use this new capacity, the wind and solar capacity, uh, to, to um, uh, displace some, uh, some conventional capacity, some like coal and gas uh, power plant. Or maybe in the future, we will need to build less coal and gas power plant because we already have this capacity into the system. And the capacity saving is the economic benefit coming from saving the fixed cost of uh, maintaining this uh, conventional capacity alive. Now, I must say that one megawatt of capacity of wind and solar is not equivalent to one megawatt capacity of coal and gas. That's because, as I show you, wind and solar are intermittent sources of energy while coal and gas are dispatchable. Practically, you can uh, turn on and turn off almost whenever you want. And the capacity credit to measure the amount of conventional capacity that can be replaced by renewable energy capacity. And in general, it's expressed as a percentage of the installed capacity. So the capacity credit is never 100%, uh, but however, it's not even 0%. It may be a small numbers. And these numbers depends on many factors, uh, geography, weather condition, and also like the um, transmission network. And in general, it, it may change a lot from country to country. But where there's quite agreement in the literature that is not 0%. And thus, there is some capacity savings coming from renewable energy. Okay, so now I can start um, our third section is the methodology, the methodology, sorry. Uh, and I will give you just a few details how we estimated the implicit carbon price. In this section, I will present data for uh, wind technology in Germany. However, for solar technology, for other countries, the methodology, it is uh, practically the same. And if you want to have more details on the methodology used, you can uh, refer to, uh, you can go and look at the papers I quoted at the beginning. Okay, as I, said, as I said, the implicit carbon price is the net cost of a renewable divided the CO2 emission reduction. So for the CO2 emission reduction, they were estimated using a deterministic unit commitment model of the German electricity market. And this model was de developed by Hannes Waite and Eric Delarue. So practically this model mm, replicate uh, the dispatchment 
uh, of electricity of the German uh, market. And we can use this model to calculate the total CO2 emissions in two different scenarios. The observable scenario, which is the scenario which practically replicate the historical data. As I said before, we are looking at the past, okay? We are, so it's not ex-ante analysis, and ex-post analysis of past costs. So the observable scenario is somehow the historical scenario. And uh, the contrafactual scenario that we call no wind, where we suppose that there was no wind at all, okay? So in this scenario, because there is no wind, it means that there is more electricity produced from uh, uh, fossil fuel generators, and it means that in the no-win scenario, the emissions are higher. And the CO2 emission reduction is simply given by the total emission in the no-win scenarios minus the total emission in the observable scenario. I will now um, uh, tell you um, how we estimated uh, the cost of renewable. As I said, the first cost is the remuneration. In Germany, uh, renewable energy, uh, they receive a guaranteed feed-in tariff for 20 years. So uh, uh, power producers of renewable energy, practically, they are paid a fixed price for each megawatt hour of energy uh, from renewable uh, energy sources. And uh, this uh, chart here, it shows the annual feed-in tariff expenditures in Germany. So practically, these columns, they are the annual remuneration given to, uh, to wind energy. And, and, and we may think to use this data for our analysis. However, we realize that's not, that's not really correct. Uh, and the reason is that first, the feeding tariffs are nominal. That is, in real terms, they decreases because of inflation. And second, uh, also the nominal level feeding tariff can be reduced um, after five years. Uh, depending on the technical characteristics of the power plant. I must say that most of the power plants, they get the high level for feeding, of feeding tariff for all 20 years, but some of them, they, the level of feeding tariff is, it is reduced. This implies that if we take the, the uh, expenditure of feeding tariff, if we look that uh, uh, wind energy, it is very expensive uh, in the first year of activities of the power plant, and cheaper later on. But it's only due to the fact that the cash flow of remuneration is practically predetermined by the feed-in tariff. That I said, in real terms, it decreases. So what we decide to do, actually, is practically to equalize the remuneration. And we are done in the following way. Uh, first, for each vintage of new installed capacity, we estimate the real annual remuneration. So for example, this is the capacity installed in 2009, and this is the estimation of the real annual remuneration for 25 years. So we suppose the lifetime of the power plant is 25 years. Second, practically we discount back this cash flow and we redistribute it in, um, uh, in a 25 years mortgage. So as if the power plant producers would receive every year the same amount of money. And now this equalized remuneration is simply given by the sum of these uh, mortgage rates for the capacity which is in service in that year. For the other costs, uh, as I said, there are two other additional costs. One is the additional cycling cost. In this case, we use the uh, model I described before uh, for estimating the CO2 emission reduction. We could only take in account the startup cost. And the additional startup costs are simply given by the total startup cost in the no-win scenario minus the total startup cost in the observable scenario. Uh, for the additional balancing cost, we could not use uh, this model because this model it is um, deterministic and is considered uh, perfect for sight. So practically, we use data from the literature. Uh, there's quite agreement in the literature that the additional the, the additional balancing costs due to wind energy are of order of few years per megawatt hours, like from one to four five. Uh, it depends exactly what you measure as a balancing cost and what is the level of wind penetration, but this is the order of magnitude. And uh, for our uh, estimation, we suppose a two uh, euros per megawatt hour for the additional balancing cost due to wind penetration. For the savings, the first savings, the full cost savings, also in this case, we use the same model used to estimate the CO2 emission reduction. And the fuel cost savings is given by the total fuel cost in the no-win scenario minus the total fuel cost in the observable scenario. Uh, for the capacity savings, 
here it's a little bit more complex because if we want to exactly estimate the capacity savings, we need to know how much, when, and which kind of conventional capacity it is displaced because of the additional wind and solar capacity. Uh, in order to estimate very well this, we, know, we need to know how the market will evolve, what will be the demand in the future, and so on. For this analysis, what we decide to do is to take a simple and transparent assumption from data from the literature. And the goal is it's, it's, uh, to estimate the order of market of this capacity saving in order to compare with the other savings. And we will see that this capacity saving are very small. They, they affect very little the final result. Practically, we use a 7% capacity credit for wind, and we suppose that uh, these credits are used in year 2015. So in other words, we suppose that in year 2015, less wind, less, sorry, coal and gas uh, generation is built because we already have capacity uh, coming from solar and wind. Okay, that's the end for the methodological section. And uh, I think now we're ready to, uh, to show you uh, the result of this analysis. So let's start with Germany. And before showing you the implicit carbon uh, price, I want to show you the result for the net cost of renewable. These are the net cost of renewable for year 2010 for wind. And we can read this chart in the following way. Here is the zero. The columns above zero are the costs. The columns below zero are the savings. And the net cost is the cost minus the savings. And it's given by this black bar. OK, if we, go, if we look on the columns above zero, that is to the cost, we see practically there is one main color. is the equalized remuneration. The additional balancing cost is very, very small. It's very tiny. Okay. If you look below on the savings, we see there is one main savings. The full cost savings is the green color. Capacity saving also, as I said before, it is, it is very small. So in other words, the net cost of renewable is simply given by the equalized remuneration minus the full cost savings. Other costs and savings, they play a minor role, if not irrelevant. Now, I want to show you the result for solar. But uh, before I show you the result, I want to ask you, what do you think that the net cost of solar is? So you think that the net cost of solar will be higher than wind, lower than wind, or similar to wind? So now I'll start our second pool. OK. I launched the pool, so you can, uh, you can vote. So I said, you think that solar will be higher, lower, or similar to wind? What is your... your intuition. Okay, oh, you were very, very quick at vote. Okay. Give you another few seconds for the last one. Okay, very good. I can close the pool, and now I can show you the result. Okay, most of you said higher than wind, 74%. Only 19% lower than for wind, and just uh, a few of you say it's similar to wind. And uh, actually, the result, uh, it's, it's correct. You got right. So the net cost of renewable for solar are much higher than for wind. So for solar, it was 44 years over uh, uh, per megawatt hour of wind energy, while for solar, it's around uh, uh, 350 years per megawatt hour of solar energy. And you can see that the, the difference is given by the remuneration. So you can see that here the full costs are more or less the same. What, what, what makes a difference is the blue column, that for solar it's way higher than for wind. Okay? And that's because the remuneration for solar are higher, because the level of filling tariff for solar are higher. They are four or five times higher than for wind. Okay? And that's because in, in, in Germany it's much more sun than wind. So wind technology is more economic than solar technology. OK, now it's time to show you the implicit carbon price. As I said, this is, equal, is, is given by the net cost of renewal, calculated in absolute term, divided the CO2 emission reduction. Here, the result for wind. The period analyzed goes from 2006 to 2010. This is the average value. It's around 56 euros per ton of CO2. So if we compare this cost with the price in the UTS, 
I mean, it's surely higher than the current price of the UTS. It's around four years per ton of CO2. But first, uh, historically, the price of the UTS went up to about 30 years. And second, I mean, now the price is very low. There are many reasons, particularly the economic crisis, also the fact that we have all, all these renewable. But if you look at the prediction on the cost given by the European Commission um, before the year 2007, 2008, before the crisis, the prediction were around, let's say, 30, 40 years per ton of CO2. So I would say that the price of order of few tenths of euro per ton of CO2, it is say no order of magnitude of the EU ETS price. I say that also because if we now look to solar, here is a completely different story. I mean, the price of solar are above 550 euros per ton of CO2. So this is above any realistic price in the UTS in the near and medium futures. And the reason for this high cost I showed you before is the fact that the remuneration for solar are much higher than the remuneration for wind because the level of feeding tariff for solar are higher than the level of feeding tariff for wind. Okay, now let's look at Italy, okay? Let's start with wind. Uh, the period of analysis goes from 2008 to 2011. The average price was uh, about 170 euros per ton of CO2. This is higher than the level in Germany. Okay, it's almost twice the level, more than twice the level in Germany. Okay, but now let's look at solar. Oh, here it's almost 1,000 euro per ton of CO2. This may be very surprising as, 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 as we know, I mean, Italy is much more sunny than Germany. So solar technology, it's more economic in Italy. So we would expect that, 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 that the implicit carbon price will be lower for solar in Italy than in Germany. But we see that both for wind and for solar, the costs are higher in Italy than in Germany. Now, there are two reasons for this result. First of all, the average remuneration, both for wind and for solar, in Italy are higher than in Germany. So these are data for the average remuneration for wind and solar in 2010. Okay, and then we see that in both cases they're higher. And they're higher also for solar, even if, as I said, uh, I mean, there is much more sun in Italy than in Germany. So in other words, the support scheme for renewable energy in Italy was much more generous than in Germany. However, there is another important reason for this result. If you look at electricity production in Italy, so these data are for 2010, we see that most of the electricity comes from gas. More than 50% comes from gas and just 13% for coal. Now let's look at Germany. Most of the electricity comes from coal more than 40%, just 13% of, of gas. So in Italy, gas, it's always at margin. Okay, while in Germany, it's, it's a different story. Now, this implies that one megawatt hour of renewable energy in Italy practically displays only gas, while in Germany it displays partially gas, partially coal. And, uh, but as we know, coal emits much more than gas. And this implies that one, one, one mega tower on wind and solar energy, it displays uh, more CO2 emission in Germany than in Italy. So as you, if you remember, the implicit carbon uh, um, uh, price, uh, it was given by the net cost of renewable over the CO2 emission reduction. Now in Italy, the costs are higher because the remuneration are higher. The CO2, the CO2 emission reduction is lower because there is much more gas. This implies that the costs in Italy are higher than in Germany. Now let's look to Spain. Somehow Spain is halfway through between, wind and, between um, Italy and Germany. Wind cost for the period analyzed that goes from 2010 to 2012, it's around 90 euros per ton of CO2. So higher than in Germany, but not as high as in uh, Italy. While solar is around 540 euros per ton of CO2. So more or less the same level of Germany. Okay, I think that I can now summarize uh, my, my presentation. First, I show you that the renewable energy incentives can be considered climate instrument in the context of the 2020 energy and policy package. Second, uh, I show you uh, how uh, we define the pricing carbon price and the relation between the pricing carbon price and the cost and savings of renewable energy. 
Then I'll just give you a few details on how we estimated the implicit carbon price. And finally, I'll show you results for the implicit carbon price for Italy, Germany, and Spain. Now, to conclude this presentation, I started at the beginning with the question, have renewable energy incentives been efficient climate policy instruments? Now, for the period we have analyzed, that I repeat, we'll look at the past, we'll not look at the future. And for the countries we have analyzed, we can say that solar energy was very expensive in all countries we have analyzed. While wind energy was less expensive than solar, I would say quite expensive in Italy and Spain, while not so expensive in Germany. Okay, I have concluded my presentation. Now it's time for questions. If you, don't have, if you do not have time now to ask uh, me a question, you can always contact me. You can see there my um, uh, email address and also uh, the address for our website as where you can download all our research, the research we have done here for renewable energy, but also we have done other important research on the uh, EU ETS. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Claudio. And now we can start the Q&A. I would like to just say that we have time to take some more questions. So if you, if our audience still have some additional questions, you can still submit your questions in the webinar control panel in the question box. And now I will ask you the first question, Claudio. Yes. So the question is, why there is a variation in the annual implicit carbon price from year to year? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it is true. I mean, that's a good observation. For particularly all countries, uh, the level of the implicit carbon price can, can fluctuate from year to year. Uh, there are several, uh, several reasons for, for that. <clears throat> okay, first, uh, the, for example, the price of uh, coal and gas it fluctuates. And this implies that the uh, fossil fuel savings uh, it fluctuates because the year with high uh, coal and uh, gas price, the savings are higher. Okay, so this first question, first one, one motivation. Second, uh, also the level of remuneration change from year to year. This is because, uh, in general, for uh, new installed capacity, the level of feed-in tariff is decreased every year of a small percentage. That's well, that's not always the case. Like. In in, in, in in Germany, for example, 2009 for wind, it was, it was increase of about 10%, but in general, for wind and solid, it, it every year decreases of a little bit. And and thus the level of remuneration tends to decrease. And uh, another reason always related to remuneration is that, for example, in Italy, in the last year we have analyzed, there was a lot of uh, big, like for some, there was a lot of, of big uh, uh, power plant where they commissioned in that year. And in general, um, uh, big solar power plants that receive a level of feeding tariff uh, lower than um, uh, than a smaller one. So the ratio of installed of, of big versus small power plant installed I mean, determine the total level of remuneration. Uh, but there is also another maybe more more little bit more complex um, reason is that um, it depends on the share of uh, coal and gas. So in the year where there is more coal, it means that wind and solar energy displace more coal and thus they, um, they displace more CO2 emission uh, with respect to the year where there is more gas. So for example, in, in Spain, in these last two years, there was a shift from, from gas to coal. So there was much more uh, electricity coming from, from, from coal. That's for, for several reasons, like a uh, ratio of coal and gas price, uh, the fact that there was less less hydro. And, uh, and this implies in these last two years, wind and solar energy, uh, they have displaced much more um, CO2 emission and thus the costs are lower. So probably to summarize, as I said, there are, there are many reasons and, and, and this reason that depends on the, on the country. So they are country, country specific. Okay, thank you, Claudio. So let's go to question number two. What about the extra network cost of connecting dispersed and remote renewable energy and distributing its output? Uh, that's a good question. 
So in this analysis, we've only looked, as I said, at uh, the cost for generating electricity. Uh, we have not taken into account the cost of transmissions. Uh, these costs uh, are very high, and there are a lot of estimation. But in general, they are high with L when, when you consider a lot of, of wind uh, coming into the system. Okay. Now, as I said, we have a look at the past, where uh, there was quite a lot of wind, but not so much to, to have a lot of high transmission cost. Uh, of course, uh, doing an ex ante estimation for future costs, where we suppose, like for example, wind penetration of I don't know, 40, 50 percent, in this case, this cost becomes very relevant. But for our analysis, our intuition is that this cost will not uh, affect substantially the final result. Okay, thank you. Next question. Aren't learning rates of renewable energy a major argument of support, which means that in the long run, the accumulated abatement cost would be lower with renewable energy than without? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, in this analysis, we have only looked at the cost in the past, so we have not taken into account learning effect. And, but you may argue, oh, okay, I mean, uh, now the costs are, are lower, but maybe in the future will be, not high, maybe in the future will be low because of the learning effect. Uh, it is hard to implement the learning effect in this analysis uh, for two reasons. Uh, first is that uh, uh, the learning effect it is uh, is an international effect. So practically, if I build if I build you know, wind capacity in Denmark, I know I reduce the cost. I probably reduce costs also in Germany. While we have only look at um, renewable energy within each country. Uh, the second reason is that uh, the learning effect it's about the cost of generating electricity. Why we have looked at the um, at the, at the remuneration, that is, at the cost of the feed-in tariff system. However, we have tried to, to estimate the effect of the learning effect in this analysis in the following way. Uh, as we know, the level of feed-in tariff it decreases every year of a small percentage. And you can argue that this decrease is because of the learning effect. So somehow the regulator realized that the cost in the future will be lower than now. Uh, now what we have done is, for example, uh, we look at the capacity in 2009, and we say, okay, in 2010, for, let's suppose for wind, in 2010 uh, there will be a reduction of uh, one two percent on the feed-in tariff system, and this means there will be a net benefit because of that reduction, and we can attribute that benefit to the capacity built in 2009, and we assume that 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 benefit is for each capacity built from 2009 up to 2010. And we suppose that, I mean, we've done some quick calculations, we suppose that uh, 2 gig of capacity was built every year. So practically, we attributed the benefit of reducing the level of building tariff to the capacity was already built. Uh, this is not exactly the learning effect, I want to be honest, but it can, I don't know, it's somehow a way to try to, to estimate. If you, if you work out the calculation, you realize that the cost decreases, but not so much. Like for wind, it decreases maybe 10%. And the reason is that uh, it's true that maybe for new capacity, the cost will be low, but the existing capacity, they will take high feed-in tariff for 20 years. So the, there is a, already a huge bulk of capacity for wind and solar that they will receive a lot of, 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 of feed-in tariff. Of course, you can always argue that there will be some technological break breakthrough in the future, and uh, some of the costs will be you know, dropped down, uh, but this is very hard to, to estimate. Okay, thank you, Claudia. I think that we have time for two or three more questions. Okay, so the next question will be, could you kindly elaborate a bit further the rationale for adding savings to costs? Uh, yes, I mean, this is, okay, uh, I call net cost. <laughs> maybe, maybe I think it's a matter of of terminology. I call net cost and cost. When I say net cost, I mean the sum of the cost and the savings. Okay, so maybe some I I, I apologize if sometimes during the talk I only say cost instead of net cost uh, because I want we want to estimate the impact in economic terms of renewable energy into the system. 
And impact is not only the cost. I mean, consumers don't have only costs when we inject renewable energy, but they are effectively also savings. I mean, uh, and, and, and it's important to measure um, all the effects of renewable energy into the system. Okay, thank you. And the next question will be, how sensible are the results to changes in gas and coal prices? Uh, they are, as I said before, uh, they, as I said before, there's a fluctuation between um, from year to year, uh, and this fluctuation is due to uh, one of the reasons of this fluctuation is the um, uh, the price of coal and gas. So, for example, if you look at Germany in 2008, the implicit carbon price is it's lower than other in other years. One of the reason it's almost it's also the price of coal and gas. Uh, I should say that uh, uh, the price of coal and gas affects more wind than solar. That's because solar has very high remuneration. No, so practically the the net cost is given the remuneration minus the fossil fuel cost. So because it, for solar are very very high, the fluctuation of fossil fuel savings affect in 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 relative terms affect less the the net cost for solar than for uh, wind. Okay, I think that we have time for two. One very short question and the other one will be slightly longer, but let's start from the shorter one. Um, are similar research done or planned to be done for the transport sector? Do you know anything about that, Fabio? I don't know, honestly. <laughs> I cannot answer this question. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so it's we don't know. It's interesting. It's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Good. So we don't know. So let's go to the, to, well, I think last question. Um, so for the cycling cost, you took into consideration only the startup cost. What would be the impact of other cycling costs? Okay, yes, that, that's, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, it's true. We, I mean, that's because the model we've used allowed us only to take into account cycling cost. Sorry, um, startup cost. But there are utterly other cycling costs, such as, for example, ramping costs. Uh, the answer is that this cost affects very, very little the final result. I would say are almost marginal. Uh, that's because these costs are very small with respect to the to the to the fossil fuel cost. So there was recently uh, a paper presented by um, Kenneth Vanderberg and, and Eric Delarue from Leuven University at the uh, European um, Energy Market Conference held in Stockholm last, last May. And they particularly studied the effect of wind energy into the cycling cost. And the methodology they use are very similar to what we have, we have used to estimate the cost. Uh, but they take in account, they try to take in account all possible cycling costs. And uh, the result is that uh, the cycling costs are very small with respect to the fossil fuel costs. When I say small, I mean uh, uh, like one, two order of magnitude smaller. So uh, maybe in absolute terms are higher, I mean, we speak about millions, but in relative terms with the fossil fuel costs are small. So if we could take in account all the cycling costs, of course, we will have a better estimation, but the, the result will not change substantially. Okay, thank you very much, Claudio. I think it's time to say goodbye right now. So thank you very Thanks. much for your presentation. Thanks, it was a pleasure to host you in the FSR webinars.